Welcome to CS Week Success Stories, second Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern webinar series. These webinars are the top-rated workshops from our attendees for Conference 39, held last May in Charlotte, North Carolina. I am John Sild, and I'm with CS Week. I'll be your moderator today. Denise Mullendore will be your host. CS Week and Conference 40 will be April 25th through April 29, 2016, at the wonderful Phoenix Convention Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This program will be recorded and available for playback along with our other archive presentations. You can find it under the Educational Venues webinars link on our website. Attendees are encouraged to upload questions in the Q&A panel on the lower right side of your screen. Be sure to click the All tab to make sure that I will see your question. We will wait until the end of the presentation to answer questions. Today's program, Collections Without Disconnects, presented by Penny Tootle, Manager of Customer Care, Las Vegas Water District. Penny is the Customer Care Manager of the Las Vegas Water Valley Water District. She has earned a Bachelor's in Business Administration, Master's in Human Services Counseling from Liberty University, and has more than 20 years of customer service and call center experience specializing in fully leveraging and integrating technology with business processes to maintain regulatory and service rule compliance while raising the bar of service for the industry and community. She is a published author and a member of the CS Week Planning Committee. We want to welcome Penny to our session today, and we're glad that uh, she has taken time to share with you uh, her thoughts. Thank you. Let's get started. Uh, first, I want to introduce the Las Vegas Valley Water District to you. Uh, we're going to share the role of, of progressing through this uh, presentation, but if you if, uh, pardon me for just a moment, I'm going to ask Denise as we advance, I'll be letting her know when to advance the slides uh, to control the pace so we can make the most of this time and still have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so let's get started, shall we? First, I need to explain to you uh, that the Las Vegas Valley Water District is actually three companies. Uh, and as a call center manager, it's important that I share that my team is responsible for ensuring that we service the customer in a variety of ways. Uh, primarily, yes, we are the water purveyor for the Las Vegas Valley. Uh, there are other water purveyors in the valley, and we share responsibility for making sure that we secure resources uh, along the lines of water delivery and treatment for the entire valley, and that is the Southern Nevada Water Authority. And uh, with that authority, uh, there are seven agencies that come together uh, to work towards resolving uh, some of the drought conditions uh, that we have here, and we collaborate and ensure conservation throughout the valley. My call center takes calls uh, that support that organization. Also, just like any other uh, industry in Las Vegas, there's always going to be a little bit of entertainment. And so we do have the Las Vegas Springs Preserve. It is the home of the first water uh, that's, that uh, provided resources for the Las Vegas, Valley, Las Vegas Valley as a whole. But also, it houses the State Museum. It's an entertainment facility for learning. Uh, we have camps throughout the year. We have uh, trains and, and uh, villages that are currently under construction that mark historic, the historic beginnings of the Las Vegas Valley. You can advance the presentation, Denise. Uh, but first, let's take a look at us um, from a credit and collections perspective. Yes, we are the largest water purveyor in the Southern Nevada area. We have a million customers, and uh, specifically the accounts that we hold are 350,000 accounts. We hold it there pretty much um, uh, throughout the year. We have about 4,000 miles of pipeline that are four inches and up. Uh, but really, specifically, when you talk about credit and collections, the majority of our customers are single-family residential. About 1,600 pipelines service their needs, um, and our small commercial customers are a part of that portfolio. Uh, we have 175 members in the call center and field services area, and that's a unique design uh, in terms of a utility organizations. Customer care and field services is one department under one leadership dedicated to uh, serving the customer needs with a meter to cash philosophy. And you'll see that come out as we talk a little bit more about the credit and collections. But um, I thought it was unique uh, that we do have uh, so many people in this one department, but we only have five people 
that are dedicated full-time to servicing the credit collections aspects of the business. We can go ahead. Um, the unique perspective that we, we have, obviously, in Las Vegas is that uh, we are selling a product that we're pr actively promoting that people use less of. And so just like most purveyors, especially in this region, uh, you're faced with the challenge of collecting for that revenue. And so there are some other factors uh, that we have to deal with as a part of our, our credit collection strategy, things that influence whether or not customers are able to pay. And that's what I want to drill into. Uh, even though we're successful with conservation and we're successful at improving um, how people's uh, behaviors impact our, our precious resource, we still have to contend with these other factors that, that influence their ability and their willingness to pay for the water that has already been treated and delivered. We can go ahead. There are some economic impacts that are very unique. Obviously, uh, bankruptcy filings, they've come down in 2014, but not down to a manageable amount just yet. Uh, Nevada fell to the lowest percent of home ownership in more than 20 years with the final quarter of 2014. We're talking about some of the financial impacts of an, uh, an economically distressed community because of the job situation, because of uh, the housing market. All of those things have had an impact on our organization. Uh, we can advance. But one of the things that we want to talk about is, um, as a utility, regardless of those impacts, we still have this one mission. We can advance to the next slide. We still have the one mission, and that is we want to be global leaders in service and in stewardship. So that's where the Mojave Desert um, is, is unique in the way that the water purveyors must address the drought and the fiscal responsibility of maintaining a system that can continue to deliver water. And so when you're a, a utility such as ours, and I want to uh, express that we are a quasi-municipality, we are not regulated, uh, we are not for profit, and so everything that we do must serve to ensure the operation continues. And so that's the challenge that my team has, is making sure that we collect all the revenue that has been delivered. Our mission, which is uh, the next slide, talks specifically about being a world-class service leader. We need to not only be sustainable in the methods that we uh, employ, but we need to make sure that whatever we're doing ensures that every customer reaps the benefits of the delivery and treatment of this service center. Uh, so here's where the challenges presented for a credit collections perspective. We don't have this mountain of resources that we can use the latest and greatest technology to, to surveil and analyze what's happening with our portfolio, but we do have enough resources internally that we can take a very smart approach to identifying opportunities to improve our collection efforts while still preserving our initiative to preserve this most precious resource, which is water, and promote conservation. And all of that has to happen within the same department. So not only does the left hand need to know what the right hand is doing, but it needs to support it uh, back and forth continuously in order for us to actualize the meter to cash philosophy in our business processes. Let's talk a little bit about some of the historical factors that have impacted credit and collections. First of all, uh, you're going to, you can see from uh, some of these, these uh, processes that we've had to deal with, we are actually looking at a, a, com a community that has gone from boom to bust in a very short window of time. If you think about the economic boom that hit Las Vegas, we were one of the fastest growing communities across the country. And so we built a rate structure around connection charges and development. And then shortly thereafter, we're seeing these massive foreclosures. And now we're seeing that as a utility, while all other businesses were going down because of that, that uh, drive in the economy, our business was staying static. And so we were not able to, to if, if, the, if the term is correct, reap a benefit from the decline in, in, in the economy, we actually were required to maintain a status of, of activity because starts and stops, which is the, the crux of our business, remained high. Why did they remain high? Because a lot of people were not only uh, foreclosing in the one house, but they were moving to another house. And so we saw instead of the, the, the boom of people that were celebrating the purchase of a home, you had a boom of people moving because they were losing their home, but they were moving to another home. Well, what does that do to a call center? Well, for a call center, it changes the tenor of the call and, of course, the time of the call because now you have people who are frustrated, who are angry. And although the water district had no, no part to play 
in what got them to that point. The water district was the recipient of those frustrations. So we had to be smart about how we approach this, uh, this new change in our, in our customer dynamic. And one of the things we did was we actually started to look at what were we creating in our own uh, angst, in our own challenges, by the calls that were being placed and the work that was being done around the delinquent portfolio. And that's where we saw some opportunity. We looked at um, who we were as a utility. As a water utility, we're generally the lowest of all of the utility bills in cost and in priority. But we still needed to build a relationship with our community to let them know that we were a part of them and that it was essential that we continue to receive revenue so that we can continue to provide the same service that we give to everyone. Uh, let's advance to the next slide. So how did we do that? We actually had to start taking a look at uh, the smaller things. We started looking at the processes. So one of the, the unique things, and, and who is a utility doesn't have a unique challenge because we're a utility and not necessarily a bank card, or because we're a utility and not necessarily a car, uh, a car note. Um, it's the priority that's given to that bill itself, but it's also the restraint of that bill in that there's certain practices we cannot employ. We still have to be a part of that community. So as we started dealing with the business processes, we started to say, how do we make some steady progress on some of these major issues that are impacting us. And so one of the things, and, and, I, and I, I challenge you to start thinking about your business in the same way. Start looking at the processes within the organization that have some influence or impact on credit collections, and I think you're going to find some opportunities. I'll get to some of those that we've actually discovered, but let's just do a real quick cursory look at some of the things that we address. Surety analysis. Um, automated dialers for the utility uh, poor aspect of your business. Um, even under TCPA, I've, I've done some recent research since the presentation and have learned that there's a considerable advantage to being a utility and addressing the actual status of the service using those automatic dialing uh, opportunities. Internal accuracy for managing unaccounted for water. And your delinquent portfolio, how is it segmented and how are you getting the advantage of how those are sorted? Uh, your lien processing, if there's an opportunity within the NRS or within your uh, utility regulations to uh, assign a lien to a property, we actually found that there was a negotiating tool in the lien process that customers were in favor of. So the reticence that we had was not founded because once we tried it, we realized customers were willing to have a lien attached to a property. And as a utility, we were benefiting because of the priority that is given to the liens that, that come from our organization. Let's dig in. Let's go a little bit further in, into this and let's talk about um, our approach. When we looked at the list and those types of processes and we started to dig in, we can go ahead with the next slide. When we started to dig into those processes, we started to ask certain questions. Um, what is our intent? When we started looking at credit and collections, we wanted to know what are we driving at? What do we expect to see from the work that's coming out of this process? What can we actually accomplish? Because there's always going to be some limitations financially or resourcefully. Um, what is the bottom line? What is it going to give us? And who is involved? And this is an interesting point because one of the things, and I'll talk about that bottom line, and I'll talk about ROI. Um, sometimes the calculation for ROI is misguided because it's only looking for a number. But there comes a point when you start to talk about the relationship and whether or not you are garnering the trust of your, your community to the extent that they are willing to negotiate for payment. And so we started talking about bottom line, and I'm going to drive our collection process on over to our billing process. Because if you're not looking at your meter to cash flow and you're not looking at what you're billing your customers, then you may be missing an opportunity to, to build trust so that they make you a priority because they recognize that you're working with them and not against them. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about one of the things that we, and, and I hope I'm using an example that you can take away and, and port it into your business and say, what do I have like this? So one of the things that we did was with our credit and collections process, and historically, we did what most utilities do. You, you process your account. You, uh, right now, I run about uh, a little over $2 million in arrears every single month. And I go and look at that portfolio in my system. Uh, we actually use Oracle's CCMB product. We've been on it since 2000.
2009. Uh, we converted directly from a PeopleSoft implementation in, in 2006. So uh, it, we've had this system in place that actually drives your collections through a work list and creates all of the events that you really need to look at. And you've got 3,000 of them coming up every single week. So that tells you, give you a picture of what our portfolio is out of 360, 365,000. You're running about that many active accounts and 3,000 of them are coming up every single week that need some type of action uh, to disconnect. Now, historically, we would just try and disconnect as many as possible. But with the, with the staff that you have, uh, 175 people in the customer care and field services department, you've got about 60 of them dedicated to your field unit. You've only got so many resources. So at best, you could probably shut off maybe four or 500 accounts every single week. But for every shut off, what are you getting? A phone call and you're having to send somebody back out to turn on um, once a partial or, or full payment is made. So that cyclical uh, business uh, model is actually creating a, a problem for you in your call center because you've got angry customers, you've got long calls, you've got uh, bills that are being disputed, and you've got media and all of these things that are happening. And we started to say, what can we do to minimize the impact of this, this process? And so uh, let's go to the next slide, and we'll talk about one of the approaches. We looked at our outbound, our opportunity to automate some of our collection calls. And immediately, our outbound dialer was there to assist us. So we started placing in 2014 uh, a hire. We were just testing this out and saying, will it give us any benefit? And we immediately recognized that it was saving us time. It was saving us resources. But it was also helping the customer who is new to this, this, this uh, financial situation that was happening in our valley. And it was giving them an opportunity to address their delinquent water service account without the shame of having to explain their situation to a person. Because the outbound dialer would place the call, let them know I've got an important message from the Las Vegas Valley Water District. If you are uh, Steve Wilson, press one, and that customer can then press one and be connected to our IVR, Interactive Voice Response Unit, make a payment without having to talk to anyone in our department. Now, we've come a long way uh, over the years. The 2014 snapshot actually includes the option to make payment arrangements, to extend the, the, the amount of time that we give them, but to just make a partial payment. It, it also uh, took that payment, even if it was a partial payment, if it was sufficient for the account, for the most arrears debt, it would issue a, a reconnect order if they had already been disconnected. So there were a lot of opportunity for us through that automation to minimize the amount of human resources that were needed internally, but to also soften the blow of the situation that those customers were finding themselves in by allowing them to manage their arrears themselves. Um, we looked at how much we were getting paid out of that outbound dialer and the way we measured that, for those that are curious, is we basically just looked at our, our delinquent portfolio and said how much did it reduce after the call was placed within 48 hours. We felt that even if the customer didn't make the payment in the IVR, that call did something to prompt that payment. And so this is uh, just a, a small snapshot of one way that we dug into this aspect of our business and said there's an opportunity. Now, here's something that's, that's uh, interesting. We looked at a cost savings as a result of this. For every time that a customer made a payment as a result of these calls that were coming through this automated system, we were actually saving on rolling a truck to shut off and turn on to the tune of $4 million in that very first year that we launched it. Each year thereafter, we've actually started to recognize that we've changed customer behavior, and the customers are relying on that phone call to make sure that they're paying us in advance of disconnecting. So we haven't eliminated disconnects thus far, but we have significantly reduced the impact that the arrears uh, portfolio is having on our inbound business and our ability to service the rest of the community. So we do see that there's a tremendous advantage there. Let's look at the other side of it. The outbound dialer, yes, it gave us some benefit, but here's something else that we had to consider. 32% of our uh, contacts in our systems were off of bad data, so we could not do 100% of that 3,000 portfolio. Imagine how much better it would be if we could improve our validation on the front end. So that's where you start to see where the credit collections uh, processes and the abilities that you have have to extend to that, that other side of the business and say, what can we do on the front end to improve this aspect of the business? The data 
was bad. The numbers are bad. What are we doing to scrub our database? What are we doing every time that customer contacts us? What are we doing when we're reaching out to the customer to validate whether or not we have good information? How are we using uh, other resources with other partnerships to get better data um, for our dialing uh, systems? And how are we matching up records? Um, the other part is managing the inbound volume. When we were placing those calls, when we first started, uh, we made a rookie mistake. 3,000 accounts come up because we, and, and the other thing is, is interesting is the water district is a four-day work week. Um, so even though our call center covers 24 hours a day, our business hours are Monday through Thursday, 7 to 6. That's when you can walk in and make a payment. That's when you can walk in and talk to a customer, and that's when the majority of, of my call center is staffed. The other thing that does is uh, from a billing perspective, from a billing calendar perspective, all of our bills, no matter how you slice it, are due on Monday. So you can imagine what the busiest day of the week is for my company. So on Mondays, if we win Monday, we win the week. Uh, Fred Dom said that from PSE and G, and I've used that as my slogan ever since uh, this last conference. And he's right. If Mondays are our busiest day, then I've got to make sure that I've got enough resources for Monday. Well, one of the first things we did when we launched our outbound dialer is the delinquents accounts come up right after that due date. So all delinquent accounts come up on Tuesday, and we launched our outbound dialer with all the calls on Tuesday. Well, you can imagine what happened on Wednesday. So we had to be smart about how we were going to make those outbound calls so that we didn't see that immediate influx of calls into the, the call center as a result of what that dollar was doing. The other thing is you busy out your IVR and they can't make payments. You've created even more frustration out of, already, out of an already difficult situation. So now what we do is we spread those calls out. Uh, we do about five, 600 calls a day and, and we take that file and we rerun it. Because even though the outbound dialer has that list of numbers, and it has that ability to make all of those calls at once. I don't want all of those calls reconnecting into the system and busying out my IVR when other customers are coming and coming into the system that are on time and trying to pay and do what's right uh, by the due dates and the, and the messages we've sent. So we've been a little bit smarter about that. We rerun it. And then, of course, as the activity occurs throughout the week and they have not yet received the calls, those that drop off, drop off. And by the end of that week's run of those outbound calls, uh, the last day is obviously a very short list. So that was one of the things that we did to, to manage that process. But let's talk a, a little bit about uh, the credit collections portfolio and how you're addressing it. First of all, um, if you look at this next slide, you're going to see it looks a little bit uh, like a CCMB uh, process flow. This, these are the processes as, as they are designed to flow electronically. And what we did was we said, okay, now let's take a step back and away from our system and let's talk about the processes and recognize, um, just click one more advance, uh, Denise, because I want everybody to recognize that there's not a silver bullet. I don't have a single solution for you that's going to say this is going to eliminate your delinquent uh, activity in the field. What I have is a way of approaching your business so that what you do is you can look at the pain points. Everybody has them. Um, go to the next slide. I think you're going to see it's something that looks familiar to you. You have rotating tenants at a property. You have problems with payment arrangements. You have the hang-ups of auto payment plans that get denied because the credit card expires or the account's overdrawn. You have uh, parcels that are being uh, quick claimed over, and the owner that you have is no longer there, especially with your small businesses. And I'm not just talking about residential when I talk about the credit collections portfolio. I'm talking across the board. So you talk about those, the strip malls, the, the, the multiple occupants, but only one person is responsible for paying the bill, and that person is no longer a party to, to the parcel. We looked at where those pain points were, and that's where we started to say, you know what? there's probably something better that we can do than to just keep rolling somebody out there, shutting it off, waiting for somebody to complain, send somebody back out to turn it on. And so here's where we saw the biggest opportunity. We looked where does the process, the system process of advancing the age of this debt converge with a business process or a business application and give us an opportunity to say, how can I get the money sooner? How can I assure that the customer will pay or follow through? How can I serve the customer so that they don't continue to fall into this 
pattern every single month. And one of the places where the, the business process converged was with our field application tools. Now, remember, you're always, and, and, and you may not use an automated uh, field device, but you are all, you're uploading information into your billing system. And as you're uploading information into your billing system, there are going to be some opportunities to improve your collection, uh, uh, your collection bottom line as a result of those processes. And we found one of those when we looked at the opportunities presented for unaccountable, uh, unaccounted for water. Because you've got field activity information and we use a, a, a automated system so we can see field work real time when it completes. And when that information updates and it tells us that I've got an occupant in a property that is not signed for, I've got a collection opportunity, but the process in our system says I've got to wait a certain amount of time because I'm waiting to go through all of these steps. But the field application has the potential to tell me more. And the reason is because there's a person on the other end of that field work. And so if I've gone out there in the field and I can see some information, I can put it into my system that gives you data that you know is going to lead to a collection action, then that's where you can insert a, a closer look and an opportunity to collect or to stop the loss before it becomes exorbitant. And that's what we started to do with this process. So we looked at what is the financial liability here and where does the financial liability lie with unaccounted for water. And in some cases, we found that the liability was with us. Why? Because in our system, we have the ability to do a back-to-back -back and not roll a truck to shut it off and take a read. Well, if we did that, if we, if we decided that we weren't going to shut off the service when this person requested it, somebody else moved in in the interim, then we've got to be very smart about how long it takes before we roll out there again and determine whether or not there's loss. Because it was our decision not to shut it off, we're financially responsible for the loss of water in between those occupants if we can't find who's using the water. And so what we need to do is make sure we close that gap so that we can improve our overall collection strategy. And we need to do it in a sustainable way. Because remember, I only have five people, and I don't want five people monitoring this list and not dealing with the, the, the bulk of our business in credit collections, and that's the payments that we can collect on right away. So that was one of the things that we looked at. But the whole goal is take a look at where your, your automation is just running along smoothly, but you keep coming up with these little pain points. And when you find something that's an anomaly and say, hmm, how did we get stuck with this kind of debt on this account, go back, look at the process, and see where we missed. It's not always enough to just say, this rep missed this. You've got to go past that and say, this rep missed this, but what did we configure that this wouldn't show up on our list? or that this wouldn't show up where we could do something about it. That's how we dug in a little bit further. The other thing we did is we looked at segmentation. I hear a lot of talk about segmentation, and, and let's look at this next slide and talk about how you can segment um, and, and, and separate debt so that it's easier to manage within such a small work group as the one we have. Um, here is where there's, there's a little more opportunity for us to target uh, the shift in how the business was responding uh, to the economy and what customers were telling us. First of all, we needed to increase automation because the volume wasn't going anywhere and I wasn't getting more staff. The staff is not growing um, and people are going to continue to fall behind and as foreclosures take place and people move, we start noticing other trends, and I'll tell you about some of the unique activity in, in the Las Vegas Valley. But also, we had to bring a heightened visibility to the, the accounts that had either very low or no consumption at all. Uh, so that was another factor because we had the uh, uh, Datamatic AMR devices. We had batteries that were failing. We had the need to replace those. But while that's happening, we still got to be mindful of the amount of consumption that's still passing through our service system being delivered to individuals and not being paid for. So we had to speak to or deal with our billing practices to make sure that we were adequately securing the revenue that we're charged with securing, whether people benefit from its use or not. We needed to make sure that we were billing it appropriately and we were following through to collect on it. The critical account outreach was one of the key components of how we were going to segment the business. We needed to look at people that were delinquent because they chose not to pay their water bill, it was just not a priority, or the people that were delinquent because something happened on their property that made paying for the water something that they couldn't do right now because it was such an exorbitant amount. When the water bill exceeds the power bill, you're probably going to have a challenge paying it. And so we needed to do a little bit more work around the critical outreach 
of how do I get in touch with this customer and help them through this process and familiarize them with what programs are available to assist them, even if it's not a program we have. The Water District does not have a low-income program. It doesn't have a senior program. It doesn't have a fixed-income program that helps people with debt. But it does have a LEAK program because one of the main initiatives of the Las Vegas Valley Water District and the Southern Nevada Water Authority is to make sure that we are promoting conservation. In this region especially, we need to make sure that we are helping people understand how to maintain their property so that water is not wasted. And so critical outreach was centered around dealing with high consumption that, was, that we believed was either attributed to leaks or malfunctions, and as much as possible putting them in a program that helps us to adjust a portion of their bill that is caused by that unexpected consumptive loss from a leak. So these are just some of the areas that we, we dealt with in segmentation, and if you have any more specific questions, we, we have plenty of time to address those. But I want to talk a little bit about that meter-to-cash approach, because this is something as a utility that we have tremendous opportunity if we can bring the departments together. Our department is unique because it is formed out of that philosophy. So meter services, which is our reads, uploads, turn-ons, shut-offs, that group has merged with customer services, which is our, our front counter, our lobby, and our cash sharing department, which is the cash in-house payments, all the deposits uh, that are made for the business, our, our customer service department, which was our, our, our credit collections as well as our front line, and our dispatching group, which services as, as a support for our emergency centers, our distribution systems, and our, our field services group. So we've got one department, Oh, and by the way, and our bill exception processing. So our bill exception processing, and some people call this key accounts, our key account management, all of that is one department now. And in order for us to, to bring this meter to cash approach to life, we had to make sure that each unit understood how they were impacting that customer experience because when they understood how they impacted that customer service experience, we could bring in processes that promoted better relationships with our community, better relationships with our customer, processes that were more uh, designed to, to fairly administer the service rules of the organization so that when customers received an invoice from us, everything we had done up to that point had established a trust factor that the water district was actually working for their community and for them. It is so much easier to negotiate for payment with someone who trusts you than someone who thinks that you're trying to get one over on them. And so that was what we did. We changed our approach to that meter to cash responsibility. We spent a concerted amount of effort and time invested in training, uh, dealt with uh, small group sessions, team sessions, building across the team to make us one cohesive unit that is centrally focused on the customer experience. And we're actually called by a, a, internally a customer-facing department. We are the face of the organization, and we are making sure that our customers know that we can be trusted. And so when we send a bill, you can trust that if you don't think it's right, we're going to do everything we can to validate it, confirm it, and if necessary, correct it uh, so that when it comes time to collect payment, you know it is actually due. The other, This is where when you start digging in and you start talking about that customer approach and our, our meter to cash philosophy, when we started to deal with the segmentation, we had already laid that foundation so that when we approached the changes that we wanted to make, we, we didn't have a, a, a lot of pushback from the customers, but we did have some building to do around the business processes to support them. Let's look at a, a couple of examples of it, and hopefully this um, translates well into your environment. Uh, when you look at multi-residential agreements and multi-residential properties, we wanted to do a better job of identifying what is really commercial. Because as a utility, you tend to label things by the meters, by the size of the, the service. Uh, water land use is common in our industry. Uh, how was the building designed and what was it in, intent? Um, we have a lot in, in Las Vegas. We have a lot of converted properties that didn't go through building planning. Uh, maybe we're the only ones with that problem, but you may be familiar with it, where uh, a, a house, a single-family residential house, is now a dentist's office or a church, and it's not in our system. And so we don't know that this is a commercial building uh, or being used commercially. The only thing that happened was there's a disconnect between our, our business licensing office and our building and planning office because that information never got updated and we didn't get the, the memo. So what, one of the things we wanted to do was go in and identify a specific customer class as commercial, even though all of the service point information says it may be residential, because 
when it comes time to secure the debt for a property, the risk is greater on the commercial than it is on the residential. On the residential, I can always track and assign the owner to that property through our county records. But with a commercial, there are a number of different entities that I now have to look at in order to determine whether or not I'm dealing with the right party when it comes to securing or receiving the debt, uh, particularly when you get involved in a distressed economy where bankruptcies are growing and unemployment is also uh, expanding. So. This was one of the areas that we looked at and how we, we classified our multi-residential services. If you have more than two service agreements, more than two addresses associated with your account, we treated you as a commercial customer in terms of uh, securing the debt with a deposit. And so that deposit, it doesn't increase the amount, it just increases the length of, of the time that we, we hold it, and it removes a, a certain level of leniency that's given when you start that service for payments. If you're a commercial customer, we do not tend to give you uh, payment arrangements on that deposit. We want that up front. It's part of the cost of doing business. And so that's one of the things that we did. Another thing we did was we looked at owner obligation for tenant debt. Um, and one of the things that, that came out with this new economy was we have a lot of uh, green landlords, uh, people that had a little extra money decided I'm going to buy a couple of, of units and I'm not going to do the diligence that most property managers and landlords do to investigate who I'm moving in and out because that's really not my issue because I can get money through these other programs if they choose to skip out on the rent. The problem is what about when they skip out on the utility? Because it, the water district is a little bit different than the private industries, we are still trying to, to represent a, a an arm of government, so we don't want to just go in and say you're responsible no matter what, even though the, the NRS gives us some rights in that area. We're still saying that the tenant is responsible for what they did because we're allowing them to sign up for the service. But what we found was some owners were letting tenants sign up, leave high debt, sign up, leave high debt, and when we started to get involved from our critical outreach perspective, we started gathering insight that some owners were not maintaining the properties, letting leaks run for long periods of time, and guess whose dime that's on? The tenants. And so when the tenants were leaving and leaving those large debts, we started saying, you know what, it's time to hold the owner responsible for what's happening. And so we created a procedure around when we identify this as a problem, notify that owner and let them know from now on, if, as long as this property is owned by you, the water service will be managed by you. And so that was a, another process that the collection process kind of gave the insight, came over to the business and said, look, how can we come up with a way to close this gap? And that was one of the ways that we did that. Another thing that we did was we looked at our bankruptcies and receiverships. Receiverships were on the rise, especially at the beginning of the economic downturn, because it was one way that commercials and residential units, uh, we have a lot of homeowners associations, and this is a typical uh, issue that came up where projects that were partially completed were going into receivership, not bankruptcy. The debt, the, everything that they had was not being liquidated. It was merely being transferred to a more responsible party, a party more apt at, at, at measuring uh, what resources they had to complete the project so that all of the investors wouldn't completely lose. But there were some restrictions. And so what we did was we came up with a process so that we were connecting with our legal team on that meter to cash philosophy. Here again, we're saying the meter to cash philosophy is not just for our department. It's, it's, it's more of we're the ambassadors to make sure that the organization understands that there's a customer on the other end that we're in the end going to have to negotiate for payment with. And we need to bring you on board so that we are being more efficient about how we're receiving, processing, validating, and receiving against the claims that are due us. And so not just uh, uh, holding it at, at a 10-foot distance because it says uh, bankruptcy or receivership, but finding out what are the real rules here and what can we collect. And we noticed that we saw a tremendous increase in receivership from those types of, of files and claims. So finally, the, the thing that we did was we, we took the approach of let's, let's, let's look where the system converges with the processes. And uh, the next slide, Denise, talks about the tactics. What did we do to, to implement some of these short-term initiatives so that we could see some long-term gains even as we, we changed our business. So obviously the deposits was a big piece of it. Uh, securing the business makes a, a huge difference, especially when you get to uh, 
cases of uh, financial bankruptcy and, and uh, receiverships because the law does give provisions for you to utilize that for what it was collected for. Uh, great opportunity uh, was discovered as a result of the delinquent uh, examination. We dedicated a commercial business team to those accounts so that we could not, um, we wouldn't have that, that disparity in how long it took. Because uh, even with residential, you can take a little bit longer to collect the debt on residential and still receive a, a good portion of what, you, what is owed to you. But with commercial, you cannot let time lapse because ownership changes and so does that obligation. And pretty soon you have nothing to collect against. Uh, payment options. We extended a number of payment options, payment arrangements, uh, things that were being extended to customers so that we could facilitate ease by which they were able to pay on those bills. And then, of course, one of the things that um, was new to our organization and, and in the last five years has grown dramatically um, and has become uh, partially automated to, to a great extent was our lien processing. We did not traditionally lien, but when we did some research, we found that the water district has a high priority uh, with our tax assessor, and the water lien, when sent to the tax roll, is paid before the property taxes. So it was essentially guaranteed debt. So we went about developing a process and, and, and uh, sharing it with our, our leadership team so that they could understand the potential that was behind it, that if we would lien accounts and we sent it to the tax roll, the only loss the district would really have is whatever administrative costs for, for recording that lien and then the 4% that the, that the tax assessor takes for collecting that debt for us. Uh, and we saw some tremendous returns in that area. I'll share those with you. Uh, in terms of deposit, at one point, 60% 60 60 of our accounts had adequate security. Um, we, we've seen that drop over time, and it's just one of those things that, as a business, you have to continue to examine to make sure that you're getting adequate surety. One of the things that we noticed in this system, though, is we needed to make sure we were interpreting data correctly. We could run a query in, in, in the, Q, in the uh, database for uh, CCMB, and it will tell me that I have a, a large amount of surety, but I need to dig in a little bit closer and say how much of that surety is paid in full. And when I start looking at that number, it's significantly lower. So it tells me that we're, we're being a little bit too lenient in the payment arrangements that we're offering in that we don't have full surety on our account. And so that 60% 60, 60 that I thought I had is actually more like 30 and so that's another thing that we said, okay, now we've got an initiative that just started about two months ago where we are actually uh, going out on the team and reinforcing with, with, hand, with hands-on training, making sure that we are collecting the surety that is owed to us up front and that we're not offering an, an installment, but we're, we're basically stating what is required and letting customers let us know that there is a challenge, and if there is a challenge, how to negotiate from the highest point. So we've done some, some work around the art of negotiation with our team in that area. In 2013 and 2014, we assigned nearly $800,000 to the tax roll for recorded liens. As of the year in 2014, nearly 700,000 was collected. I just wanted to give you some perspective on the potential that's there. Water theft uh, now, instead of being monitored on a quarterly basis from a report, it is monitored monthly. And right now, the most that we hold outstanding is three months with a window uh, for resolution. And so we are seeing uh, accounts that are being managed to the extent that we are, we are no, no longer extending beyond a three-month window, and that's, at the out, that's the conservative number. Uh, for the most part, we are two weeks turnaround time on water theft or water loss. The bottom line is, and, and is we can go ahead to the last slide, is that our monthly arrears debt runs about $2.6, $2 $2.8 million. We've done enough work on these other business processes that we have found that at the most uh, we're doing 250 field orders in a month for $40,000 in, in collections. So when you start looking at digging in and saying what is that bottom line initiative, we really reduced, in 2014, we had reduced our, our disconnects down to um, maybe 50, 50, 50 shutoffs, high priority critical debt uh, in a week. And so when you're looking at 250 shutoffs in a month, look at what that does to your call center. Look at what that does to your collections if you're able to successfully secure that collection amount through another source. One thing that came out just this year, uh, since we've been doing this type of reexamination of our business, is we slightly increased our delinquent disconnects this year to address a momentary issue until we can 
can change behavior, we recognize that we may have to do some shifts because we started to pick up on a trend with squatters. So through the work that Credit Collections has done, they've actually been able to identify the pattern of people that are living in properties without the permission of the owners. And we have done a, a significant uh, uh, number of, of shutoffs and collections as a result of identifying the squatters and involving and engaging the homeowners and banks proactively. <coughs> Beg your pardon. So this has been tremendously successful this summer. Uh, going into the, the, the peak season, we've noticed that our, our write-offs are continuing to decline on a monthly basis and on an annual basis. We, start, we ended out this year with an additional reduction and still coming well under the million of anticipated uh, write-offs that we have. Um, we can go to the last slide. So the one thing I wanted to do was just stress that this, collections is the one thing that everybody puts off until the last minute. It's one of those things that until you actually have to dig into it, you never get around to it. It's one of those things that most, uh, when you implement, it's the last thing to be tested because you realize it's just going to get dirty the more you dig in and the more you realize the opportunities, you just don't have the resources to manage. Take it one process at a time. Take it one discovery at a time, but by all means, get around to doing it. Everybody has that potential. Everybody has that opportunity, but if you could just dig in to one anomaly at a time, one process at a time, deal with the things that you know you have the resources to deal with, and come up with strategies for moving forward, you're going to find some success. You're going to find great opportunity there. And what is the write-off to revenue percentage? We are write-offs are 0.49 percent. That was the 2000, uh, the last, uh, our fiscal year ends on July, uh, July of every, July 1st of every year, and we were at 0.49 percent write-off. Uh, so that is uh, tremendous. We do have a, a, a lot to be proud of when it comes to our write-off process and, and what we're able to secure as a business. Um, one of the things that as a utility we're obligated to hold debt for 180 days before we can write it off. And so what we used to historically do was wait until the end of the year and then work our write-off between April, uh, May, and June, and then that would be the, the item that we submitted to our board for approval. And what we learned was there was a lot to be gained if we worked right off every single month. We took credit and collections to the front line and we asked the associates to make it a part of their, their standard account analysis to collect on write offs immediately. That was one of the first things that we did. And the other thing was we did it on the back end on the credit and collection side to work the write offs as they came up every single day. And when we got to the end of the year, we would do a, an analysis of what was left and do more uh, transferring debt, collecting on debt, proactive outreach and calls on debt. And, uh, and of course, the, thing, the work that we were able to, to do with the liens uh, to secure that and remove that as our write-off has just brought us tremendous success over the last three years. Uh, it's just grown. We've always had some improvement, but not to this degree. That's all I have. Any other questions? Penny, I, that was a great presentation. Uh, thank you for uh, the time you've uh, put forth and, and given us this presentation. I, I have several questions that have come across, and so I'd like to start with this one. Um, in reference to your third-party agency, how much are they contributing to your overall collections? Well, that's the thing. Third-party agencies aren't uh, beating down the door trying to get our business because they're finding out that it really doesn't do them much good. Uh, we assigned uh, our write-offs last year, not not this close of uh, fiscal year, but 2014, we assigned $1.3 million to our outside collection agency, uh, and we collected, the Water District collected 271000 against that debt. Our outside collection agency collected $76,000. Uh, so they get a percentage of that, and so it really didn't prove very lucrative for them to have that portfolio. Of course, 76000 is, is is still 76000 but in terms of the, the percentages, we're not seeing them uh, producing a lot because the nature of this business is the customers come back to us, and by moving that write-off collection to the front line and the first uh, service uh, activation, anytime somebody calls, we're going to collect on anything that's owed. So it's, it's just a, a great opportunity for us. All right. There's some other have, questions here. Yeah, we have questions coming in right and left. Do you want to go 
Uh, sure. See. One is the I answered the one question about write-offs and what is our percentage uh, from Kim, and uh, Bianca's asking how do you overcome delays in decision making when factoring in other partners? Was this ever an issue? Um, where I am, it really affects how nimble we can be. <laughs> yes, it's an issue. <laughs> the reason why we became one department, we cut down a lot of barriers by making everybody part of the same team. Um, I'm sure everybody doesn't have that luxury, but one of the things that we did was, uh, here's the, the funny thing, credit collections drives the return that everybody in the company gets. And so that became the narrative. You control that narrative. You can share with people, let me show you how much I'm collecting of the revenue, and now let's talk about that retirement that you're looking forward to. Because the bottom line is, if you don't collect on the revenue that's owed to your organization, nobody in the organization profits. And so I started sharing with people how I needed their help so that I could collect more revenue so that we could secure what the company needed to continue to operate. When people understand that, and one of the things that really did help also along the way was you get one person in senior management who understands that, and I can tell you who that person usually is, your CFO. He understands how the checkbook is funded. And when you get one person to be your spokesperson, that's who you run your initiatives by. And make sure your initiatives can solidify what it's going to bring to the company's checkbook. When I rolled out the initiative for the when I rolled out the initiative for the outbound dialer and some of the I had a partner in the business with me who was working with the collection side, I was working with the system side and I was able to help understand help people understand not only am I going to bring money in, but let me show you how much money you're going to save. When you bring that to someone who's responsible for your financials, you have an advocate that kind of helps the decision making along the way. How have ISO standards uh do you have ISO standards for credit collections? No, we don't have ISO standards for credit collections. I would like to have ISO standards for that, for our business, for our, our call center, as well as our field. But we're not there yet. We're working on it. Uh, we're, we're getting there one process at a time. But right now we don't have those. How much control and cooperation do you have with your IT department to configure your IVR? Is that in-house or do you have... Oh, well, let me tell you, the IVR right now is, is a, little, a little problem, and I don't mind sharing with people. Uh, of course, my contact information uh, is available, and if you'd like to reach out to me, penny.toodle at lbbwd.com, I'll be glad to answer any questions, or if you want to place a call and we can get on a conference call with, with your peers if we run out of time in this session. Because our IVR has been a challenge. Our IVR is, is, is a hosted service. It's provided by an outsourced provider. And um, it costs money every time you want to manipulate or change your IVR. So we, 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 we have to be very smart about how we approach changes. We have to bundle it and make sure we get everything in one shot so that we can negotiate one agreement, one amendment to the contract, and move on. Um, we are moving away from that. Our outbound dialer is now going to be something that is a little bit more flexible. Our outbound dialer is coming uh, in-house, it will be hosted by a, a provider, but it will give us more flexibility to manipulate it. But, yes, that is one of the challenges. But my relationship with the IT department has been key to all of the successes we've had as an organization. We, we went out immediately, and one of the things I like to do is build a strong relationship with IT. And it doesn't matter to me who I'm building the relationship with because I recognize that my, limit, my limits are my knowledge. And I need IT to help me to understand not only what my systems can do, but what other systems are out there and what they can do. And what should I really be working towards? Because before I buy a car, I need to learn how to drive a car. And before I buy, a, like what I used to do is I'd go out and just buy a car. And then I'd go buy a cell phone. And then I'd go buy a device that I could use hands-free. And if I didn't know what was out there, I wouldn't know that you can buy a car with all those things. But right now I'm driving a Studebaker that doesn't have hands-free, and I have to be in the right location in town in order to get reception. And what I'm doing with IT is they're telling me, okay, you can prepare your business for this new technology by changing this process that requires these three manual touches. That's what I'm doing. By building a relationship with IT where I rely on their knowledge and insight, and they know that I'm not just running them up a, a, a 
chasing butterflies or an invisible rainbow. They know I'm serious about moving my business forward. We have a mutual respect and understanding for what we're trying to accomplish. I've engaged them in the customer interface, and I'm asking them to help me build what's coming next. And so that's a lot of the things that I'm doing in credit collections are preparing for the systems that I want to implement. With IT's insight, with IT's influence, I'm able to understand that what my systems are doing now, I, can, I can't do with, this, with, with the limits that I have, but I can put a business process in place so that when that system comes on board, I'm not tied to this manual process that requires two queries and one report and three emails. So IT, my relationship with IT is very strong, um, and we do a, a lot of uh, collaboration when it comes to the changes that I want to make. They're very aware of what knowledge resource I have. How did I do that? And that's one of the things that people say, how did you do that? When they need help, I give it to them. I bite the bullet, I take the hit, and I give it to them. When they're implementing things that are going to interface with our system, I know they're always going to be short testers. I've got some whiz-bang uh, users. I use it as an opportunity to build employee skills, to uh, Im improve employee performance, and increase their knowledge. But I give IT resources for end-to-end -end testing for other systems that don't benefit me at all. But to us, it's a partnership. And if they're going to build a system that informs our system, then it doesn't improve the service I can give to the customer. How does the lien process work when the debtor does not own the property? It doesn't. <laughs> when the debtor doesn't own the property, it doesn't work for us right now. We do have a service rule that we're proposing to our, our senior management that aligns with the Nevada revised statutes because the district does have the right to lien even if the property is owned by somebody other than the person that secured the debt. But right now we are a politically sensitive organization. We do not want to rustle uh, the community's feathers in that, in that respect. And so we try to keep it to the debt that's owed by the tenant. However, in those cases where we know that an owner has, ne has neglected a property and has um, recused himself from the process of maintenance and, and let the tenant own the responsibility of trying to maintain their asset, we notify that owner and we let them know we're going to put the service in their name so that at the time that debt is left, it is left in their name and we will lean that. And so we do some things right now that are preparing us for when that service rule does get approved. We will already have a notification process in place that we, we can expand and, and continue to move forward with a little bit more um, uh, aggressive uh, approaches to collections in that, in that respect. Did you experience any legal challenges with implementing the owner sign only process? If so, what were they? No, we didn't have challenges. Actually, our legal department was very supportive uh, because we came to them with a proposal that kept the customer informed. Again, we did not want to use strong arm collections. We wanted to make sure our customers were educated about what we were doing. And so anytime we wanted to implement a change, we wanted to tell the person. And so we informed our owners in advance. We tell our owners, look, this is what's happening at this property. We notify them with whatever resources that are available to us by phone, their existing account records, or by the assessor file through letter. To let them know this is what's happening, and in 30 days, if this is not rectified, we will put the service in your name. That's the beginning of the relationship with us and the owner. Um, so we didn't have any challenges. It was really just an education and informing us of what the laws and the rights were according to the revised statute. What billing system? We use CCMB. Uh, we are on one of the early 2.4 versions, and we are in the middle of uh, preparing to upgrade uh, and to get us up to Service Pack 10 and hopefully on to 2.5. Um, do we manage it in-house or do we use external providers? We manage our billing system in-house. We have a very talented IT team, and they kind of keep us up to date. I do have a staff member on my team. Uh, who is a technical specialist, and I have a technician. They don't report to IT, they report to me, and they serve as a liaison or more of a desktop advocate for our team, making sure that our systems are operating as anticipated, fielding uh, initiatives, issues from the floor, and making sure they're legitimately uh, issues that IT should source or things that they can troubleshoot on their own. And they manage a lot of the changes and implementations that are coming uh, to our floor. So those oh, are all the questions good. that I see. Penny, well, we're nearing the top of the hour, and we won't be mindful of everybody's time and uh, close our session on time. One quick note for our attendees, uh, the call for submissions, uh, that it, we've extended the deadline to August 21st, so there's only 10 more days. So uh, please get uh, your submission uh, in, and so we can take a look at it. We will have our uh, meeting and review all the submissions for our next conference. Uh, again, we want to thank Penny 
and all our attendees for joining us today. And as we top the hour, we want to say thank you to everybody, and uh, this ends our webinar.